temple and some things, some insights related to the temple from, from looking at some insights to several chapters. We're not going to be able to read, obviously, everything, but several chapters related to the book of Ezekiel, particularly chapters 40 through 48. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel details out to us what the temple is, the, the, the third and final temple is going to look like, what it's going to be like, what it's going to encompass. And those, those, that description is from chapters 40 through 48. And it has very significant implications for us and for people that we're trying to talk to about the real gospel and the real Messiah. So today, the, the title of our message today is The Gospel of Ezekiel, The Temple Restored. Because this Shabbat is a gift to us from Hashem intentionally that during the midst of our mourning for the temple, we get to look forward to and get a glimpse of the restoration of that temple, may it, may it be in our time and soon. So as a result of that fact, in lieu of the traditional blessing that I pray as we start to dive into a drosh, I'm going to instead read Psalm 30, which is a psalm for the inauguration of the temple. And it's an intriguing psalm because as we read Psalm 30, as you're about to hear, I'm sure you've read it before, but maybe it's been a minute. But as you read Psalm 30, it starts out by saying a psalm for the inauguration of the temple, but then the rest of the psalm doesn't really talk about the temple. So the question becomes, why is this a psalm for the inauguration of the temple? You would expect, I would expect, that it would say something about the Mizbeach, it would say something about the Kadosh, it should be say something about the Kadosh HaKadoshim, it says something about the Aaron, but it talks about Hashem's deliverance because when we get to stand there at that third and final temple, we will sing this song as a song of deliverance. And that's why it inaugurates a temple because it testifies that we were in exile, but God always had a plan to restore us. And so how, here we have Tehillim, the third, the 30th Tehillim, a psalm, a song for the inauguration of the temple by David. I will exalt you, Adonai, for you have drawn me up and not let my foes rejoice over me. Adonai, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. Adonai, you have raised up my soul from the lower world. You have preserved me from my descent to the pit. Sing to Adonai, his devout ones, and give thanks to the his holy name. For his anger endures but a moment. Life results from his favor. In the evening, one lays down weeping, but with dawn, a cry of joy. I had said in my serenity, I would never falter, but Adonai, all is through your favor. You supported my greatness with might. Should you but conceal your face, I would be confounded. To you, Adonai, I would call, and to the Lord, I would appeal. What gain is there in my death, in my descent to the pit? Will the dust acknowledge you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, Adonai, and favor me. Adonai, be my helper. You have transformed my lament into dancing for me. You undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness so that my soul might sing to you and not be stilled. Adonai, my God, forever will I thank you. Now, let me explain something else about the significance of that psalm we just read to introduce us to this drosh today. If you think about that psalm, what is, what's the message that Hashem is trying to send to us? What's the message that King David is trying to send to us? The message is that the restoration of the temple, the inauguration of the temple, is tantamount to God saving us from the pit of death. That the restoration of the temple, the restoration of the literal physical temple, is tantamount to turning our mourning into dancing. Now, this is crucial because biblically, what we learned in the, in, in the, the last drosh we, we did on, on this topic was that 
those who are mourning for the destruction of the temple and yearn to see the temple restored will be the ones who get to rejoice in Jerusalem. The prophet Ezekiel makes it crystal clear that if you're not going to mourn the, the temple, if you don't think that the physical, literal temple of Jerusalem is anything to be to mourn over or to want to see again, then you will not be included in those who get to rejoice and dance in our streets. The Psalm 30 is saying to us that the inauguration of the temple will result in our mourning turning into dancing. If you don't have the inauguration of the temple, then that mourning will not turn into dancing. If you don't have the temple, then you won't be saved from the pit. If you don't have that temple, then he won't rescue you and heal you. You see, there's a direct correlation, and it's the literal temple. I have said, and I'll repeat it here, that this concept of the third and final temple, a literal and temple, I keep saying literal for a reason, a literal third and final temple, that this concept that Ezekiel is bringing down, understand there are nine chapters in the book of Ezekiel dedicated to this topic. Say nine chapters. I didn't say nine verses. I said nine chapters. If you believe, as has been taught by Paul, the false apostle and heretic who has led many into a destruction, if you believe Paul, then you have to take these. Just If you believe Paul, then I want you to open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 40s through 48. Reach in there with your hand and rip those pages out of that Bible. Indeed, the entire book. If you believe Paul, see, the reality is, if you believe Paul, you have to deny the, the prophets. It's, it's intriguing to me that people say, you know, you, let, let me show you Messiah through the prophets. No, no, no. You believe Paul, you have to deny the prophets because all of the prophets preach a restoration of Jerusalem with a temple, which Paul denies. Indeed, Isaiah says that in Isaiah chapter 2, just, the, just one chapter after we read today, in Isaiah chapter 2, because look, in Isaiah chapter 1, it's a little confusing for people that don't know what they don't know because God is saying, I don't need your sacrifices, your new moons, your, your festivals. Who, who commanded you to bring these? Well, my response to that is, you did. You're the one who commanded the sacrifices. You're the one who commanded the new moon festivals. You're the one who commanded the festivals. That's true. So why is he calling them yours? And the answer is because we're doing all that, but we're not really, our hearts aren't really dedicated to God. We're just going through the motions. The same reason that whenever the people, the children of Israel were rebelling in the wilderness, you ever notice, if you read the story, that suddenly God referred to them as your people, Moses? <laughs> I do that to Rebbesine still to this day. I said, hey, your dog is messing up out there. <laughs> you need to take care of your dog. <laughs> What, she's not your dog? Not now. Not she, now, my dog is obedient. Your dog is disobedient. <laughs> but it's true, right? So what's the, is, it mess, is, is it that God doesn't want sacrifices, that somehow they're evil? No, he's the one that commanded them. What he wants is those things with the dedication of your heart. I'm about, I'm about to prove it to you in, a, in a, a, a passage of Ezekiel here in just a minute. Now, how else do we know this? Because it'd be real easy for somebody who doesn't think it, think, you know, think things through to read Isaiah chapter 1 and say, oh, he, see, he doesn't care about all that stuff. But see, Isaiah chapter 2, see, it's why, it's why it's important to read things in context. Isaiah chapter 2 says that he's going to bring people, all the nations, say all. Now, all is an interesting word because it insinuates and implies and infers a totality. Give me all your money. Right? I want all of your heart. I'm going to eat all of that pie. It, when you say, I'm going to eat all the pie, if you, if you told somebody, I'm going to eat all of that pie, are, are they thinking in their head you're going to have a slice? Okay. So all infers everybody. Say everybody. 
No, no, you said everybody. I said everybody. Okay, that's a whole nother level. Everybody is one thing, but everybody, that's everybody, man. So everybody, everybody's going to come to Jerusalem. All the nations are going to come to Jerusalem. And what are they going to do? They're going to come to the what? Temple on the holy mountain to do what? What does it say in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3? To do what? Learn the law of Moses. That's awkward. See, this is why if you believe Paul, this is not a drosh against Paul, but it kind of is. But if you believe Paul, you have to deny the prophets. Well, no, you know, a, a Christian would say, read Isaiah 53. By the way, Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah. It is. Judaism even says it is. Read Isaiah 53. My response is, read Isaiah 2. I will, I will concur and I will acquiesce that Isaiah 53 is talking about the Messiah if you will acquiesce that Isaiah chapter 2 is talking about you keeping the law of Moses. Did we have a deal? No, no, no. I want you to believe in JC, but I'm not going to believe in the law of Moses. I'm sorry, friend. Yeshua is the law of Moses. You can't have one without the other. Now, before I go on to torpedo this entire thing once again, with another verse, let me read from this insight here about the, the temple and why it's important. This is an excerpt from the Talmud, Barakot 3a. It says, Rabbi Yosef said, I was once traveling on the road and I entered one of the desolate houses in the ruins of Jerusalem to pray. Elijah the prophet, may he be remembered for good, came and waited for me at the entrance until I had concluded my prayers. He asked me, my son, what sound did you hear from inside those runs? And I replied, I heard a bat kol, a heavenly voice, moaning like a dove, saying, woe unto the children who, because of their sins, I destroyed my, heavenly, my temple, burned my sanctuary, and ex exiled them to the nations." Elijah said to me, I swear by your life and by the life of your head that not only at this time does it say this, but rather every single day it says this. And not only that, but whenever Jews enter the synagogues and study halls and call out, may God's great name be blessed. The Holy and Blessed Be He shakes his head and says, how fortunate is the king who is praised thus in his palace. And what is left to the father who has exiled his children? Woe to the children who have been exiled from their father's table. Now, the commentary to this, this particular insight, says, without a penetrating understanding of the essential meaning of galut, exile, a Jew cannot properly await the geula, which is the redemption. See, and this is so crucial because there's many people today, and, I, I, man, you know, I speak pretty firmly, pretty directly, pretty harshly against Paul. I, I make no excuses, nor do I make apologies for that, okay? Because he's a liar, and he has led many people astray. The reason I do what I do is, is the same reason why I would say this to any, I would talk directly and firmly and frankly to anybody who was threatening my family. I'm not going to go out there and kind of, you know, well, gee, jolly gee, you probably ought to get off my lawn right now because you're kind of threatening my family. If you don't mind, I would like for you to back up. That's probably not going to go down like that. I wouldn't encourage that. So, but I'm doing this because there's people out there that I want to save. There's people, there's many Christians who need to get born again. There's a whole lot of Christians out there who need to get saved. Here's the deal. They're, they're waiting for the redemption. They're looking forward to the redemption, and that's good. The problem is they don't know what, what the exile looks like. And as a result of not knowing what the exile looks like, they can't properly look forward to the redemption. You and I need to have a glimpse 
of what the redemption looks like so that we can understand what our exile is. And having a glimpse of the temple, having a Shabbat Hazon is just that. We've got to see what we're missing so that we understand what we need to mourn for. So it says here, this is what Elijah the prophet was trying to say to, this, to Rabbi Yossi. He's trying to explain to him what you're missing. Elijah explained it like this. Exile is not merely captivity and enslavement because you're free to travel as you please, yet you're still in exile. Nor is exile religious persecution because you, Yossi, are free to pray as you wish. He says, you can't even say that exile means that you're not in the Holy Land because, behold, here you are in the Holy Land. Yet even here, God's voice continually moans and aches over those who are in exile. See, the reality is we have the state of Israel, and thank God we do. But see, what we have to understand is just because there's the political state of Israel, and, and, and we support it, and thank God it's there, and may God defend it, and may its enemies be crushed. Even still, we're still in exile, and I don't mean because we don't live there. Even if we live there, ladies and gentlemen, if, we, if you and I lived in Israel and ate at that fabulous Thai kosher restaurant every day, and we went down to the hotel every day, and if on Shabbat we could stand in the plaza of the hotel and I could give a drosh to all the Lapidniks that were there. Mm. Come on. We still would be in exile, even if we had an apartment, which we can't afford, right up there next to the hotel. Soon. As soon as, you know, God blesses us. But seriously, we would still be in exile. So he says, what then, Elijah is explaining to Rabbi Yosei, what then is the nature of exile? Why do Jews cry over it? What is it that we are lacking? And the answer is that we have everything except the base of Mikdash. We have everything except the holy temple. And the, the person might retort and say, but no, no, but, but isn't the Messiah the risen temple? Isn't, aren't we now the temple as if there was a temple, but an, a physical building, but now we're the temple? My response to that is, he, that's all spiritually nice. And by the way, all of that comes from Judaism. When the, when the tabernacle was first made, God says, now that you've made the tabernacle, I will come and dwell with them. It didn't say dwell in it. It said dwell with them. See, Judaism teaches that man is the, is the candle of God and the soul is the flame. Surprise. <laughs> what? Judaism teaches that man is, the, is a temple? Uh, yeah. That comes from Judaism. So you see, the fact that man is the temple, that did not replace or negate the, the literal temple. See, it's not an either or. It's not a grace or law. It's not a temple or man. It's, it's, not, either, it's not either or. Interestingly, God, is, God wants everything. And there's a lot of people who don't follow the law of Moses who just want to compartmentalize stuff. I'm telling you right now that the law of Moses, the Torah of God, Judaism is the real grace message. That's the trick. Indeed, as I taught about the Pharisees, I did a whole series on the Pharisees. I told you, to, probably to your shock and amazement, that the church has been lying to you for 2,000 years. The Pharisees were the progressives. The Pharisees were the liberals. I'm not promoting a political stance, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about politics in our current day and age. I'm simply saying that back then, they were not the legalists. The Sadducees were the legalists. The Pharisees looked for ways to make Torah easy on people. It's a shocker, I know, because you've been taught your whole life that the, the Pharisee, to call somebody a Pharisee is to refer them, to them as a legalist. If you went back 2,000 years and lived in the realm that we like to call reality, 
They would have laughed in your face if you said that. Because the one who's the real legalist is the Sadducee, who is a word of God only person. Example of Christian grace. If you're married, you can't get divorced under any circumstances unless there's sexual infidelity. But if he's beating the tar out of you up one side and down the other, can't get divorced. If he's abusing you in some way, can't get divorced. That didn't go over well, did it? It's true, though, isn't it? You could, you could, in certain denominations, you can get up in the pulpit and say, I used to be a drug dealer, but now I came to Christ. And everybody would be like, woo. You could get up in the pulpit and say, I used to be in prison as, on, uh, 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 as convicted of murder, but I gave my life to Christ. Woo. But in certain denominations, you know what you can't do? You can't be in ministry if you're divorced. Conversely, in Judaism, although it frowns upon divorce and makes every effort to save the marriage, it makes all kinds of conditions for divorce. And you know what's interesting? Just on this topic, did you know that an Orthodox community, Orthodox Judaism, the divorce, the divorce rate, the non-divorce rate is 98%? I'm not making that up. I didn't just pull that out of thin air. That's a literal survey. 98% of the marriages in Judaism, nobody gets divorced. Do you know what the divorce rate is in Christianity, the one that forbids it? Off the chart. Basically, it's one out of three. So somebody said one out of three. It's off the chart. You know why? You see, the tighter you grip legalism, the tighter you grip legal, legalism, is that things fall apart. Judaism says, oh, you can get divorced if you want to, but we, we, we don't recommend it, and we're going to try to work through it. Plus, you know, there's this whole thing about the law of Moses and stuff like that. So look, it's saying here in spiritual terms, it says here the, the, the reality is without the Beis HaMidash, in spiritual terms, we are homeless. Even if we're in the Holy Land, we're homeless. This is why we need to see the temple. We need to have a, a, a vision of the temple so that we can see what we're missing so that we can begin to long for it. Because I want to repeat myself again, pardon me for doing so, even if we were living in, in, in the old city of Jerusalem, we're still in exile. We need the holy temple. Now, I, I want to I point something out here before we go to the beginning of this. I just Because I want to go to this right away because I don't want to not get to it, which sometimes happens in these droshes because there's so much information. We're not going to really read these chapters. We just don't have time to. There's nine of them. There are nine chapters in the book of Ezekiel dedicated to explaining what the third and final temple is going to look like. And there's a lot of people out there that believe in God and believe in the Messiah, they think. I say they think because they believe the Messiah, uh, they believe in a Roman Messiah who's completely, the gospel thereof is completely false. But nevertheless, they would hold up the Bible and they would say, I believe in the Bible. And there's people out there that if you stood in front of them and said, hey, you a Christian? Yeah. You believe in God? Yeah. You believe in, in JC? Yeah. So what do you think about the third and final temple in which there's going to be sacrifices and a priesthood and stuff like that? And they'd be like, what? No, 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 no. There's no sacrifices. The, the, the sacrifice of Christ did away with all that. Or they would say, well, there might be, but you, you understand the person who builds it is going to be the Antichrist, and he's going to trick a bunch of Jews. As a Jew, I laugh at that. That's not going to happen. And especially when they say foolish things like the Antichrist will be a Muslim or the Antichrist will be somebody from the Vatican. Can I just tell you, rest assured, as a Jew, we would never like, oh, hi, Mr. Muhammad, you're really the Messiah? And you're gonna, oh, great. We're not that stupid. But anyway, I digress. 
I'm going to read to you something here from the Ezekiel chapter 44. And uh, for the ladies in the back there, Ezekiel chapter 44, 7 through 9. We have a couple of ladies in the back just kind of training on the equipment back there. Just, just know that with me, you're going to have to just roll with the punches. Uh, Ezekiel 44, 7 through 9, I want to read this because how many of you know that most, now listen, uh, let me preface this by saying my, my discourse here about Christianity is about trying to overcome wrong theology to help people who are stuck in Christianity come out of it into the real gospel, okay? How many of you how many of you know that there are a multitude, a multitude of Christian denominations, be it Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Pentecostal, non-denominational, that teach circumcision as a religious right? You have to circumcise your baby boys on the eighth day according to the Word of God. There's not a bunch of them? Is there any of them? None of them? On the eighth day, circumcised as a religious rite, not as a, you know, it's a good thing for medical things, kind of helps you from getting the cooties, but I mean, as a religious rite. Anybody? <laughs> My wife is davening right now. Help him, Lord. No, there's not, is there, right? There's not, there's not a single denomination of Christianity out there that teaches that circumcision as a religious right. Even though, even though it's a biblical commandment, and even though every single hero in the Bible was circumcised to include the Messiah, and we know who Paul is, but they think he's amazing, Paul even had Timothy circumcised. Paul, who taught specifically against circumcision, had Timothy circumcised. Now, when you bring that up to people, they usually say, well, that's because he's trying to appease the Jews. That's a great leader. How many of you like to have a leader who likes to just appease people, do something that they're fundamentally against, that they believe is actually a contradiction of the gospel just because they want to make people happy? Raise your hand if that, that's the kind of a leader that inspires you. Can you imagine? What would you think of me if Rebecca and I went on vacation and you just happened, somebody, you know, I don't know, saw me there and sent you a video of, of us eating at the local crab bar on Shabbat in Florida. And then when you're like, wait, Rabbi, wait. You were at a crab bar on Shabbat on your vacation in Florida, and I said, well, I'm just trying to make all the beachgoers feel comfortable. Would you be like, you know what? Way to go, Rabbi. Woo, way to bring him in. When the saints come marching in, when the saints come marching in. Will we be among their number? I mean, is that not absurd, patently absurd? Thus, when someone says, when I'm among the Jews, I act like a Jew. When I'm among the Gentiles, I act like a Gentile. When I'm among the LGBTQ community, I act like an LGBTQ community person. Does that sound like awesome? No, it's disgusting, and as it should be. So, some would say... You don't need the circumcision of the flesh anymore. You, need this, you have to have the circumcision of the heart. Most people who say that don't believe or don't realize, Hannah, that the circumcision of the heart actually comes from the law of Moses. It's the first time it's ever mentioned is in the law of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, what does the prophet Ezekiel say about the end times? Now, the beautiful part about this, chapter 44, which I'm coming to now, is that this chapter is talking about a future time, you know, end times, revelation, end times. This is going to be part of our end time conference. 
okay? We're going to have an end time conference, and then we're going to have a circumcision ceremony. <laughs> it's going to be packed out. But listen to this. It says Isaiah 4, excuse me, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 44, verse 7. It's gonna, may, it may read a little bit different because I'm going to read it from this translation. So it, may be, it may read a little differently, but it should be okay. When you bring strangers of uncircumcised spirit and uncircumcised body to be in my sanctuary and to defile, say defile, defile my house, okay, profane it says, when you bring my food, fat, and blood, and contravening, contravening my covenant, okay, meaning, as it's saying here, they have broken it, okay, by all your abominations. So it's referring, it's saying here that to be uncircumcised in both heart and body is to profane, indeed, it's to break the covenant. It says, you did not safeguard the charge of my holy places, and you appointed as guardians of my charge and my sanctuary whomever you pleased. Verse 9 is, is, is the, this is the torpedo midship, okay? Thus says Adonai Elohim, no, say no. I'm going to read it from the screen just so that we're all on the same page. No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, may enter my sanctuary. Not any foreigner who is among B'nai Israel. Oopsie. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Yaakov. What about the Noahides? Uh uh, the provision for Noahides is found on, it's not, give me a second. It's not there. I mean, kol amar Adonai, 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 kol ben nakar erev lev, a man has to be circumcised in his heart, ve'erel basar, and his flesh, lo yavol el mikdashi leko bin nakar, or otherwise you can't come to my sanctuary. Asher benatok ben Israel amongst the people of children of Israel, you have to have, according to the word of God, according to the prophet of God, who is speaking about end time reality. If you don't have the circumcision of the heart and the circumcision of the flesh. You will not be allowed into the sanctuary of God. Not only is there going to be a sanctuary of God, that's a news flash for a lot of people, but if you're not circumcised in heart and flesh, then you're not going to be allowed entrance. And by the way, whose fault is that? Paul's fault and your fault for believing him over the word of God. Now, you might be asking yourself, self, surely this temple of which we're speaking here is not going to be like, you know, like a temple, temple, temple. It's not going to be a temple, temple, temple where things are done. It'll be like, it'll just be for show. It'll be like a museum. How many of you have ever thought, now listen, what we're talking about here is not just about us as Jews visualizing this, understand what we lost, but there's a lot of people out there that have believed a false gospel. How many of you know people today, friends, family, coworkers, strangers, that believe that there never again will be any sacrifices? How many of you know people, strangers, friends, family members, coworkers? who believe that the Arianic priesthood has been abolished. Is that something that they might believe? How many, how many of them believe that it's been abolished in lieu of the priesthood of Melchizedek? 
Somebody said to me this week, by the way, on a chat, on a, on a comment, they said, I can't believe that you would say what you say about Paul because don't you know who his teacher was? And I wrote back, I said, you talking about Gamaliel? I said, by the way, I have a doctorate degree from MIT. I'm not going to show you any proof of that. You just have to take my word for it. I have a doctorate degree from MIT. Because I said I did. I was also a Navy SEAL, and I have the Medal of Honor. I'm, no, I don't. I'm just kidding. But I told this person, I said, look, can you tell me a little bit about Gamaliel? Like, what was his philosophies and beliefs? And which, which of those beliefs did Paul up, uphold? And which ones that he talked specifically against? And where can I find that in his letters? Can you tell me who Rob, Rob Gamaliel's teacher was and who was his student also? And what did they talk about? Can you tell me what you know about Rabbi Gamaliel or Judaism? And the answer, of course, was they know nothing. So I said, well, as a matter of humility, you might want to submit to somebody who actually knows something. You see, I don't know what, you might have somebody out there. You know, Yosef. Yosef's a trained engineer, educated engineer. I would imagine if somebody came up to Yosef and says, I'm also a trained engineer, an educated engineer. And Yosef began to talk to this person only to find out that they're an utter buffoon who doesn't know anything about engineering whatsoever. <laughs> he said it's happened. I, I, I promise you, if this is a very simple analogy, okay? Yosef walks over to me and says, hey, Rabbi, heads up. Yes. That person over there says that they have an education, an engineering education, a degree, and they're experienced. I had a chance to talk to them. Yes. They don't know anything about engineering. I'm going to suggest that they're not telling the truth about their credentials because they don't know anything about it. Now, I wouldn't look at Yosef and go, well, how do you know? How can you judge? How would you even possibly know that, Yosef? No, I would look at Yosef as Knowing him, knowing that he's a trained engineer with lots of experience and education, I would be like, that's messed up. <laughs> Get that idiot out of here. What's wrong with him? I wouldn't even, I'd, I mean, it's a, yeah, that's stolen engineer valor. So I'm telling you today, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know anything about Jews or Judaism or Gamaliel, just because Paul told you that he was a student of Gamaliel, that's your proof? You have a doctor from MIT. Trust me. I'm not lying. But you might, you might want to listen to someone that knows something about this topic. Like a little something. I know a little something. And when you're with me, and when I'm talking about to people, and I'm hearing that they don't, they don't know the kindergarten level Judaism. They don't know the kindergarten level. I'm going to say, you're probably not a student of Gamaliel, most likely. You're probably not even a Jew, actually. And you should trust that since you don't know anything. Just like I would trust you, like I trust Yosef, if you told me that somebody da-da-da-da, okay? All right, right? Now, what if, going back to the temple, is it going to be a temple museum or is it a functioning temple? Well, let's ask Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 42, beginning in verse 13. Ezekiel 42, 13. This is what it says. Then he said to me, the northern chambers and the southern chambers, which are by the fortress, they are holy chambers where the Kohanim, whoa, stop. Where the who? The Kohanim. The Kohanim is, that's Hebrew for priests. I thought there weren't going to be any more priests. Awkward. Were the priests who come close to Hashem may eat the most holy. What's that talking about? 
That's talking about the sacrifices. A lot of the sacrifices you ate of. It goes on to say, there they may leave the most holy, the meal offering. There's going to be meal offerings? Yes. The sin offering. There's going to be sin offerings? Yes. We're talking here, I want to remind everybody, about the future third temple. Now, you may, you may be listening online and really hate what I'm saying right now. You may not even like me. You may not like my suit which I actually kind of like. <laughs> but I want to let you know that I didn't write this. This is the Word of God. Okay? And so it goes on to say, okay, so we have the, so, so far we have the meal offering, that's the minka. We have the sin offering, that's the chatat. And now we have the guilt offering, okay? Now we have the guilt offering. And that says, uh, the Ha uh, Asham. And it says here, for, for the place, Ki Ha Makom Kadosh, for the place is holy. In other words, what this passage is teaching us here is that the temple is going to be a functioning temple with priests and with sacrifices. Now, this much we know. There's a lot about the temple, incidentally, when we're looking at these chapters, there's a lot about the temple that is very mystical, and even the design of it is not precisely understood. And even Rashi broke, broke uh, as, among others, Rashi brings down that we're really going to need to have the Mashiach come and explain some of these inner dimensions. And th indeed, this is why Rashi believed, um, among others, why he believed, and he quotes the Talmud on this in a couple of different places, he believes that the, the temple is going to come down. There is a uh, insight here that the temple is going to come down as a flaming fire. It will be a temple of fire that will, that will come down from Shemayim. Okay. There's another insight I wanted to, to mention here. It says, God wills that there will be a new Jerusalem only because he wills that there will be a place to welcome the divine presence. Therefore, without a temple, there is no new Jerusalem. The, the, the book of Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 7 also makes clear that the temple, God says right here in these passages, God says the temple will be his throne and his footstool. Interestingly, just the, there's a Memtet sighting here I wanted to point out to you. So in chapter 42, it's talking about the return of the Shekinah to the temple grounds, Okay. Prior to this, there is an angel who shows up with a measuring rod in his hand, and he's, he's taking Ezekiel on a tour and, and showing him everything. Then when it's all done in chapter 43, this angel is gone, and he sees the, the glory of God return to the temple. He, earlier in the book of Ezekiel, he saw the glory of God leave the temple. Now we've seen the, the Shekinah of God come back to the temple. But it says here in verse 6, He's talking about the glory of God filled the house. And it says in verse 6, I heard him addressing himself to me from the house. And then a man was standing near me. And he said to me, now this is the man, the man speaking, Ben Adam, this is the site of my throne. This is the site of my footstool. Now, interestingly, in the commentary, it says, Ve'ish haye amed ezeli, or ezli, slika. A man was standing near me. The commentary reads, this may have been the angelic guide who led him through the temple in the previous chapters, or it may have been a different angel. Although the angel still accompanies Ezekiel, he no longer speaks. The voice emanates from the Holy of Holies. In other words, this, this is Memtet. This is Memtet who shows up 
and he's speaking in first person. This man shows up and says, this is my throne. This is my footstool. There's a lot more I want to share with you, but it's just, it's, it's too much. But I wanted to share this one final notation. We've talked about a great many things related to the temple, and I encourage you to go back and read. Today would be a great day, and, and tomorrow as well, to read through these chapters from chapter 40 to the end of Ezekiel and really try to get a glimpse. And again, a lot of it has to do with measurements and so forth, but just ask Hashem to help you, help you visualize the temple. But I wanted to leave us with this one thing because, again, we want to rescue people from bad theology. And so after we get through this time period of the three weeks, we're soon going to be coming on the 40 days of Teshuvah, which is going to take us on a fast track right to Rosh Hashanah and then, of course, into Yom Kippur. You're going to have a lot of people out there, a lot of people that we need to rescue, that want to follow the law of Moses, but they don't want to be Jews. They want to do this Hebrew roots thing. And why do they feel that way? It's because they won't let go of Paul. If they let go of Paul, they'll be healed, okay, because Paul brings a spirit of anti-Semitism. That's why they don't want to be Jews. But one of the things they say is, where is Rosh Hashanah in the Bible? Because their idea is Nisan is the head of the year, not Tishrei. They're wrong. And here is Rosh Hashanah in the Bible. It says... In the 25th year of our exile, this is chapter 40, excuse me, sorry, chapter 40 and verse 1. In the 25th year of our exile, on the new year, on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year, after the city had fallen, on that very day, the hand of Hashem came upon me, and he brought me there. Now, in the, in the, the Hebrew reads this, Be'esrim ve'chamesh. Shana, legaluteinu, berosh hashana, beasur lechodesh, bearba, esre shana achad, ashre chukta achir beezin. Now, it says here, berosh hashana beasur lechodesh, the rosh hashana on the tenth of the month, the tenth day of the month. What is that talking about? Well, this is taking place, this vision is taking place during the Yovel year, the Yovel, the year of Jubilee. And it's the Scripture brings down in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 16, that in order to count the year of Yovel, which is the 50th year, that were to sound the shofar on the 10th day of the month, the month of Tishrei. What's the 10th day of the month of Tishrei? Yom Kippur. During the Yovel year, it brings down the Talmud that on that particular year, even though the, the Jubilee is counted from the first of Tishrei, but it's officially judged on Yom Kippur, and therefore that year, it, Yom Kippur, is referred to as Rosh Hashanah. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. This is just pure logic. If the new year is to be counted in Nisan, which, by the way, the Bible never says that, but if the new year is to be counted in Nissan, if that's the real new year, then why do, we, why do we count the year of the Yovel in Tishrei? Why would you wait six months later to sound the shofar? Or do we sound the shofar in the month of Tishrei because we're counting the years? That would make more sense, right? You would count the year and the month in which the year is counted? That would make more sense. The point, in fact, here is that the word Rosh Hashanah is literally found in the Bible here in the book of Ezekiel. Interestingly, it's found in the Bible in the book of Ezekiel that is talking about the, the beginning or, 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 or having the third and final temple. In other words, our jubilee is directly related to the restoration of the Beis HaMikdash. Amen. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem.